I went to Northwestern. Um, Gail Williams was kind enough to let me sit in her studio and observe the studio classes. But yeah, I, I couldn't take lessons. Um, so I studied computer science, cognitive science, and Chinese at Northwestern and sort of had the awakening that my failures to that point in music weren't a result of some fixed lack of talent, but rather just lack of quality practice. We are talking today with the person who is responsible for my new favorite app. I haven't been this excited about a music app in, I don't, I don't know, in years and years and years. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And today's guest is Modacity CEO and co-founder Mark Gelfo. And Mark has had a really cool path through the music world. He and I dig right into the app from the outset. So just a little bit on Mark's history. He went to Northwestern University, where I went to school, uh, though he didn't overlap with me. He overlapped with my wife as a computer science and then cognitive science major. So not a music major, but had musical experiences as you heard in that opening clip. Then Mark went to Indiana University as a horn major, he's a horn player, and got into the Macau Symphony, then the Hong Kong Philharmonic. Fast forward a few years, he finds himself in San Francisco playing dozens of weeks as first call horn with the San Francisco Symphony, and he started his own company. He did a startup accelerator and it's around a topic that we all (laughs) think about and are struggling with on a daily basis. If you're anything like me, at least you're struggling on a daily basis with practicing and how to practice and how does your brain and your body and your time, how does that all interact? I can't say enough good things about this app as you'll hear in this interview. Modacity.com Co. is where you can go to learn more about it and definitely download this thing and give it a spin. I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Robertson and Sons, D'Addario Strings, and Upton Bass. We'll hear from them in a bit, but let's dig into this conversation recorded live on the streets of San Francisco. That's those buses that you're hearing in the background. That's what that is with Mark Gelfo. <laughs> All right, so what I thought would be interesting to do, so here with Mark Gelfo in Soma in San Francisco, right around where he's headquartered, Mark of Modacity, the the company and the app. And what I what I thought would be interesting to do is actually start, um, this might seem kind of backwards, but I want to talk about the app right away. And I think that will lead to some interesting uh discussion of like why you did this and kind of get into the backstory. So that's cool. Um, uh, Modacity is probably my favorite music app in the last five years. Just really, really, really amazing app. Um, Talk me through the, okay, so someone downloads Modacity, which they should do (laughs) if they're listening to this. Uh, They open up the app. What do they see? What does it look like? Well, you open the app and you're going to see a little introduction to the value prop first and you create an account so that we can cloud sync you. And that after you've created an account, you'll be on the home screen, which is like your dashboard. So you're going to see the minutes that you've practiced, your day streak, and the number of improvements that you've logged using deliberate practice. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, uh, so I have all these playlists and I, I want to talk about that whole interface, but I go and I start up my playlist, which I've got everything I'm working on right now. It's just like an iTunes playlist, but it's it's my warm-up routine. It's my uh, stroke-in, my Hal Robinson book. It goes into my etudes, then it goes into the pieces I'm working on. And I click on the first piece, and, and what do I see? I see two things. I see a timer, yeah. counting the seconds yeah. that and minutes that I've been practicing, and I see a microphone. Okay, yeah. so why am I seeing a timer and a microphone. Why did you decide to build it that way? Well, it comes down to practice efficiency. Okay. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it is an equation with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones, one of them is retention, and the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. And what Modacity aims to do is optimize music practice efficiency for anybody who wants to uh, use it. So. First things first, you got to measure time. Right. Time is of the essence. You want to get the highest return on your time investment. And the way to do that is through listening to yourself mm-hmm. but, and self-recording. Uh, almost everybody who reads the blogs, blogs of Rob Knopper, Noah Kagayama, everybody knows self-recording is absolutely essential. So we put it front and center along with time. 
Okay, and I love the way that it's implemented uh, uh, because you, you, you press record, it records, and then you press stop, and the default behavior, correct me if I'm wrong, is just yeah. immediately playback. Yeah. And, and I know that seems simple, but there's just something about, there's something about the interface, the way you've created, so hats off to, to the, the, the details on this. Um, it's made me go from almost never recording myself, even though I tell all my students and people, anybody asks, what should you do, record yourself, record yeah. yourself. I have personally, Jason Heath gone, and I've gone from like almost never recording myself, like probably once every four months, yeah. to like, I've been probably doing it a dozen times a day at least. There's just something about that yeah. button, right, being there, that you're just pressing it and recording it, and so it, the, you, the, it will count whatever you're doing in terms of seconds and minutes, or you can set a timer, which is yeah. pretty cool too. Yeah, I love budgeting time. Yeah, I, I what what I do when I load Modacity every day is if I don't have a playlist constructed already, what I do is I go in and I think, uh, how long do I have to practice right now? Okay, I've got 40 minutes. Cool, I'm going to do five minutes on meditation, get my body state right. I'm going to do scales for five minutes, and I'm going to visualize, and I'm going to do this piece that I'm working on. You just set it up, see the budget, and follow the budget effortlessly by delegating that to the phone. And then everything you're doing on a day, and I think this, I think this is super cool. Everything you're doing through that routine is being logged within Modacity, and yeah. you can go into your history, and you can see it's essentially created a, a log of your practicing, a very detailed log of your practicing. Right. right. You shouldn't have to do that manually. Right. It's like accounting before the spreadsheet was manually handwritten ledgers, and that's where most musicians have been for the last 200 years. And it's time to automate that and save some time and let people focus on what's really important, which is performing on their instrument. So if you went to my mom's house, and shout out to my mom who listens to these, but, but you, would, you would find on a shelf all these practice journals dating back to, I think, 1991. I was an obsessive practice journaler. Yeah. And, and what's, what's so cool, one of, the, one of probably like, a dozen things that I love about about this app and the implementation is you you build a playlist of what you want to do, which is essentially like making a practice plan. It is making yeah, a practice plan. It is. But then you can get in there granularly and you can interact with that plan and then it's all being recorded. And I can't tell you how cool this is to go back and look at your history and to see like how much time you're spending on this, how much time you're spending on that. Um, yeah. You're done with your practice session and you press finish and it will give you the option to... Um, to uh, set a timer for the next day for when you want to practice, yeah, right? Yeah, set a time. And with the history, what I really love, I use the deliberate practice feature in Modacity a ton. Yeah. So what I'm logging my improvements. Oh, I improved my articulation today by using this strategy. Um, and, and then I see that in my log. So I see all the improvements that I made, the strategy that led to that improvement. I see the star rating as well as the time spent. So I'm starting to track the evolution of my mastery on particular practice items now that Modacity has been out since March. And I can see the, the actual curve, the plateaus that I hit, when it goes down, when it goes up. It, it's, it's very satisfying. Well, and Mark and I were just comparing our Modacity star ratings. I could tell that Mark's standards are much <laughs> higher than mine. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like one of those guys that's like, great movie or very good movie. So all my mm -hmm. stuff is like five or four and a half. Mark, Mark's probably a little more realistic about his, his progress. Um, but... but uh, that, let's talk about this deliberate practice mode because I think let's it's a lead it. into your whole backstory. And yeah. Mark and I actually have a lot of shared background, and and somebody's really angry here in Soma. Uh, but <laughs> there we go. Um, Another so, horn player. So, <laughs> so deliberate practice. This mode in Modacity, when I first started using the app for the first couple of days, I didn't use this, and then I did use it, and it and it just described this mode because I've really been enjoying using it. I found it to be really helpful in really drilling down on what I need to be working on. Talk about deliberate well, practice. Yeah, I mean, one of my pain points as a musician developing, uh, well, I started French horn when I was 11, piano when I was five, was like not really having a method to generate reliable improvement. And deliberate practice is like the scientific method for music practice. So what you do is you identify the one thing that you want to improve, be it articulation, intonation, emotion, comfort, whatever it is you want to improve, and brainstorm or choose one of the pre-suggested strategies for that area of improvement, and then test it out. Record yourself trying that strategy, listen back, and press yes, it worked, or no, it didn't work to create that improvement. And we log all of that, and 
um, it's part of actually sort of like the biggest science project ever on music practice where we can collect that data and start to aggregate what strategies worked the most for what improvements worldwide. Well, and it has made me, okay, so I, I just full disclosure here, practicing is probably like between number three and 10 on my list every day. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is never number one. Uh, many of you listening, it should be number one. Uh, it's, I just do a lot of, I wear a lot of hats in my life. Um, but I'll tell you, I've been practicing, I've been enjoying practicing more. As a result, I've been practicing more since I've been yeah. using Modacity. So thank you, Mark, for <laughs> that. And I've been practicing better. And and there's a there's an intentionality that I see as I use this. It, that I feel that the app is is encouraging good practice behavior. And and some of it is that easy accessibility of the recording feature. Some of that is the the timers. That seems simple, but but that but and then and then this deliberate practice, being able to I'm working on, on a piece by Andres Martin, composer that many of you listening will recognize. And and then I hit a passage and I really need to work on this passage. Well what does that mean working on a passage, right? That's just a vague thing. And I think that's what so many of us say. Oh, I need to work on that. Well really, what does that mean? I need to improve this, I need to improve what and so I I love how the app walks you through that process of identifying what you really need to do and then recording it. What does it tell yeah. you to do next? Record. And, and, and when I saw this, I was like, I don't want to record, I just want to work on it. But 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 I, I that prompt is very intelligent, uh, yeah. intelligently placed there. And as a result, because I see that, I feel bad if I don't record it, so I record. I listen back, and what I what what it's doing, and I know that this is, or I I I gather this is intentional. Is it's to sort of separating out the process of performing from the process of analysis. Am I right? Precisely. Okay. That's talk, talk so about important. That. Okay. Well, performing is primarily a motor activity. You're sending external motor commands to your body based on a concept or intention that you have, and analysis is the opposite. It's a sensory activity. It's a receiving, perceiving activity where you're judging and discerning what based upon what what inputs are coming in. And they're almost opposite processes, and I believe that it's far more efficient to separate them out. And this, this came from Arnold Jacobs, actually, who mm -hmm. talks a lot about the motor pathways, sensory pathways, as being sort of mutually um, independent. So it's, it's very important to be able to perform in a mindset that's about putting out rather than analyzing how you're doing as you're like 50% attending to what intention you have musically. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violin Shop. And here's a clip from Robertson Shop founder Don Robertson on how the fingerboard has an effect on the tone of a double bass. When you think of the uh, vibrating string, it vibrates on top of the bridge, but it also vibrates at the upper end. And the mass of the fingerboard can enhance or, or distract from the vi that vibration. So we never know what it's going to do acoustically until... Get it on there. No, the, the setup, the the arching of the fingerboard, the the camber, and the arching from side to side is also very critical. We see fingerboards with too much arching, so when the player is playing, he feels like he's falling off. If it's too flat, then uh, string rattles. So it's uh, it's a headache. Getting your bass set up properly is a tricky business for sure, but Robertson's does a fantastic job of that. Learn more about everything they have to offer at robertsonviolins.com. Well, and Arnold Jacobs, uh, if folks don't know, the famous uh, tubist of the, San, of the almost of San Francisco that I live here, of the Chicago Symphony, and he wrote a great book. Is it called Wind and Sound or something like that? He wrote a few books. Wind yeah. and Song is yeah, one of wind them. Wind and Song. Yeah, thus Spra also Sprock Arnold Jacobs okay. is a good one. And he's like he, he. I think of it as a pioneer in the science of performing. I don't know if that's the right way to think of it, but he, but he definitely, definitely ahead of his time in terms of pedagogy. I know brass players, regardless of their instrument, would go and play, go to the south side of Chicago and play for Arnold at his play. Well, it's funny. Um, Arnold Jacobs really brought the tuba and the trombone forward immensely. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the tuba before Arnold Jacobs is like a totally different chapter right. in tuba musicianship. And in some ways, I don't think French horn has quite gotten there yet, if I'm mm. going to be completely honest. We're like the laggards of the brass section. Trumpets, virtuosity since Herbert Clark. Tuba, low brass, virtuosity since Arnold Jacobs. But horn, it's kind of like, we still think it's okay to miss notes. We, we still expect to miss notes. And I think it's because of our approach. And I definitely was uh, conditioned 
to think that the French horn was a very hard instrument, and that has really limited my success until I started thinking about it differently and applying these Jacobs concepts. Okay, this is a great door into your backstory, and I know it's weird to start with, like, like the, the, usually people talk about this at the end, but I've just been digging this app so much, and I know it's it's your passion right now, too, so I just want to, yeah. so, so, okay, uh, I, so, I, French horn is your instrument, and, yeah. and, and maybe we could start there with, with, um, why do you think that's the case, that, that, that there's that, that you, French horn players, have or typically been indoctrinated to think that the French horn is hard. Can you just talk about that and why the other brass instruments maybe have made those leaps and French horn hasn't? I mean, I guess it comes down to us technically playing in a higher part of the harmonic series yeah, okay. of the instrument. But I don't really believe that because at this point, a lot of horn players are using double, triple horns and they're playing exactly the same thing that a principal trombone player is playing or a, a scream trumpet player who has no issues with the fact that their harmonics are a a step or a half step apart. I think that it was almost like a fluke of French horn culture that some people thought it was hard and it got a reputation for being hard as self self perpetuating phenomenon and that that limiting belief became embedded in French in horn culture around the world and yeah, it's time to reclaim it. So I, I'm going to I'm going to take listeners in a reverse chronological order as I know it of Mark's background. So Mark, here we are speaking in San Francisco. Uh, Mark has played uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of weeks with the San Francisco Symphony and and as a, a horn player. And then prior to that, he was a horn player in the Hong Kong Philharmonic and in Macau. Macau, before yep. that, which is remarkable uh, for anybody, but especially given that Mark actually wasn't a music major, though he want. Am I getting all this right? He yep. wanted to be a music major, oh, but didn't get <laughs> didn't get into any of the schools he auditioned for on music. Did in uh, computer science, I, I believe. did for computer science. Okay, I went to Northwestern. Um, Gail Williams was kind enough to let me sit in her studio and observe the studio classes, yeah. but yeah, I, I couldn't take lessons, um, so I studied computer science, cognitive science, and Chinese at Northwestern, and sort of had the awakening that my failures to that point in music weren't a result of some fixed lack of talent, but rather just lack of quality practice. Okay, so that so so let's talk about that because, and I know that that's that's a major passion of yours because people are listen people listen to this podcast. I think we've got 170 countries that that have listened to, at, at the, the, um, and I get I get emails from people all over the world, not in major. They're thinking like I want I want to get better, I want to improve, but I'm not I'm not near a major conservatory, I'm not near this. Um, and though you went to a, a school like Northwestern, not a music major, and and then and then in a way that, that most people would probably think you know, on the outside is remarkable. Like, wow, you're, you're playing in one of the world's major orchestras. So, so how, how did that happen through deliberate practice? Okay, when did you make that discovery? Talk about that. <laughs> what the heck happened to make somebody, um, to, 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 I guess, level up to be able to do that and then be uh, runner-up for orchestra like L.A. Phil and playing all these weeks with the San Francisco Symphony? Just take me on that journey. Well, if I'm going to be honest, I, I don't think that I can own that process and yeah. say that I really understand that, that I did it by myself. There was a lot of mentorship, a good element of luck. Definitely just the primary ingredient of desire, perseverance, ardent practice. But yeah, I mean, I was at Indiana. I, w I did get accepted to Indiana mm -hmm. Music School right after Northwestern, and I started studying audio engineering and French horn performance. And there were 50 other horn players in the Indiana studio, and bless them all with their own strengths, talents, interests, but not all of them ended up playing in symphony jobs. And I think the reason that I was able to go from, uh, you know, second undergrad at Indiana to winning a job within two years of that and dropping out was because I practiced differently and had a different understanding of what it means to learn, what the learning process looks like, and a different standard for how I use my practice time. Okay, so, so break down, how, how do you think this discovery of practicing differently, deliberate practice or mm -hmm. whatever term we want to use, um, uh, how does the practicing that you did and that you're doing and that you maybe discovered or learned, how does that differ from what so many people do? Like, as an example, like I, I, 
how many times prior to finding Modacity, I pull my bass out and I'm yeah. banging away at something, and it's like a look at oh, 45 minutes have gone by, and I yeah. I kind of got some I don't know maybe got some stuff done, kind of got frustrated. Then I look in the mirror, my bow's crooked. I'm like sort of like this yeah. I'm like this this tornado of chaos, you know. Yeah. I, I, um. So so how how do you how what how does that like that's Jason on a bad day. How does that approach differ from maybe what you've discovered and explored? Yeah, it's J- it's it's Jason. It's Mark. It's probably most <laughs> of the people right. listening have practiced that way. I I would call that aimless practice. Right. Okay. And it's very tempting. And, and Noah Kagayama's documented this really well. Where something like mass practice, where you repeat something ten or fifteen times, it actually feels better. So a lot of the strategies that we intuitively use feel better in the short term because we're stuffing something into our short term memory loop, but it's actually not making it to long term memory. And it's a ridiculous waste of time. Okay, so yeah. that's totally, so here's another discovery. I, I have, how many times over the years I've told students, you gotta do it at least four times in a row. You gotta do it at least, I haven't been doing that since I've been using Modacity. Yeah. yeah. Instead I've been recording yeah. and listening back and analyzing. Yeah. Uh, so, What's up with that? <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? I mean, I would love to get more data on that. I think that there's a, there's a value to repeating things, but there's more value in, in discovering and spacing the repetition of what you do to yeah. bring it to automaticity. Right, because how much, we don't know, it's such a complex beast, and the, the learning process for anything, but in music, it's such a complex beast, and and I, I know I've read or heard you say some of the, how, the percentage of musicians that are injured in some way, uh. and how much of that comes from mindless repetition, or or a, a repetition based in anxiety or fear, or, yeah. or, or what have you you and so just I, I, I sort of see maybe I'm painting you know too much on it but I sort of I sort of I'm, I'm feeling that that concept that I've had my whole life of like oh I got to do it four times eight times 20 times whatever sort of being challenged when I you oh, when yeah. I when I record myself as frequently as I do which is kind of one of the central tenets of modacity so I I, I, I really it's making me uh, be more analytical in what I'm doing rather than thinking, okay, I solved the problem, now I gotta do it four times in a row perfectly. Analytical at the right time. At the right okay, well. at the right time. Yeah, okay. which is something that I've been analytical at the wrong time yeah. for many years of my life during practice. And yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with the ten thousand hour idea yeah. from Anders Ericsson. Like I feel like I put in a good ten thousand hours becoming an expert at analyzing my playing as I was playing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Talk about that. Okay, because oh. that's something that I that is definitely I, I feel that separation happening using this app. Okay, yeah. I feel that I'm I'm, a, I'm able to perform where I perform, and knowing that the analytical Jason, future Jason, is gonna is going. Th- there's a time and a place for that, but it's not necessarily while I'm playing it's in not. the audition, in the performance. It's really right? not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really not. There's a great book called Choke that talks about this, and uh, again, Noah, bulletproof musician, talks about the external focus like a distant focus being more successful than an internal focus so if you're analyzing how you're feeling as you're performing or how it's going it's just inevitably taking brain cycles away from the act of of performing and Mm -hmm. contributing which is what you where you should be focused okay uh so so there's a there's a lot we haven't talked about in terms of just like uh, what we're offering in the app? What am I? What am I? Mi- oh, one thing we didn't talk about that I want to. I want to make sure I talk about. And it's it maybe is more of a surface level is the wrong word. I think this deliberate practice stuff that it's getting at this intentionally. That's like this really beautiful thing. But but man, just as a set of tools that will level up your practicing, Modacity is awesome. So another one. I don't think we talked about the Metro Drone. Oh yeah. yeah okay. So <laughs> the Metro. Tr- t- 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 Take us through the Metro Drone, which has replaced several several apps that I have <laughs> that yeah. I've used for years. I think the best way to talk about the Metro Drone is to just get it going over okay. here. I think that's coming through. Oh yeah, it's coming through. So it's, it is, yeah. in fact, a Metro drone. It's a Metro drone. Yeah. It's just what you think. It's a repulsed and, pulse and, drone. And you can change the length of that drone. You can make it very That's staccato. Right. You can make it a little more legato. Yeah. Um, 
it, uh, you can just drone. You can just click, and yeah. and I know this seems silly, but but I'll tell you the, these little details. It, it, it's obvious that a, a, a musician was really thinking carefully about all these things. Even mm-hmm. folks, even the tapping the tempo. You tap the tempo button. I can't tell you how badly that works in most apps. And you tap it a few times, and then it just gets your tempo, and it goes with the tempo tap. Um, the, the, that alone is is a fantastic tool. And you can have the Metro Drone, and again, download this app. If, you, if, you, if you're listening at this point and haven't, so you can see what we're talking about. But the Metro Drone, if you're, if you're actually practicing a piece, it'll come up and fill like half the screen. And you can interact with it, and then you can hide it, um, or you can go into full screen Metro Drone mode. Yeah. And um, so that is a, an amazing tool. Uh, other things that this does, it will archive your recordings, right? So you can record, yeah. and and the default. I, I don't know if the default behavior is the right word, but it will. It'll just delete it if you. you yeah, can it's record. a scratch pad. Yeah. you have to opt into saving your recordings, which yeah. is how I think it should be. Right, because because it actually encourages you to record more. Because I think like uh, yeah. you know, then you just have all this garbage every day that like I don't want to listen to my yeah. C major scale yeah. every day. You know, going back five years, but there's no know, reason. But but you can selectively save, and and then what you what you save, it, you you can then access through these different interfaces. These yeah, overview. you can share it to your computer, or yeah. send it by iMessage, mail, whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can take notes, yes. uh, which I have been doing. So talk about that. Oh, this is so good. I okay. mean, this is like when you have that insight about what to do. Excuse me. This insight about what to do next time you practice Einhells and Leben. Oh, I've got to take a cosmic breath before yeah. I do the down the down bow, and and you got to write that down and have it somewhere. And what Modacity does, it takes that notes and puts it front and center for you as a to-do item that you can check off, just swipe up when you're done processing it or keep it there when it, however long you need it. That, and then it's, it's yeah. displayed as like a card. Yeah, right? it's like it's a little like a, card. It's a little exactly. card, and you can flip through these cards, and so you can get rid of them. But I found yeah. that really useful, and I've even been, I don't know if this is the intended purpose, but I've even been taking notes like in some of these chunky technical things, like what passage I'm on, just yep. so I can come back and remember. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. That's super cool. Uh, being able to reorder playlists, make make different playlists. It's like you have your, it's just like using <laughs> iTunes or some program like that. You can, you have your, you have your, your, pieces or you have whatever you enter in your practice items and then you can rearrange them in these different playlists yeah. you can heart things to favorite them yep. um, so you see those in the interface this episode is brought to you by Diderio strings our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that Did you know that you can tell the difference between Diderio strings by the silking? Peg and silking denotes pitch and tension. So E is green, A is black, D is yellow, and G is red. C, by the way, is purple if you have a C string. A thin band of yellow just before the metal winding denotes light tension. And a thin orange band of silking denotes heavy tension. Ball and silking, that's the stuff down by the tailpiece, denotes string family like Kaplan, Helicor, or Zyx. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. One thing that has impressed me about Upton Bass ever since I got to know them was how many artists there are out there that are so satisfied with the work that Upton has done for them. Here's Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, outstanding band, on her experiences with Upton. I have the Upton travel bass. A friend of mine who was in a band called Brown Bird, I think she'd had some work done on her bass and she had a pickup that she got from Upton and she knew one of the guys who worked down in the um, factory in, in Mystic. Also, calling it a factory is really charming because it's really just a barn that smells amazing. There's right. lots of cool bases and, and very sweet men. Chris Wood, he had two Chadwick bases with him. And so I like got my courage up and sort of sidled over to him at one point. I was like, I need a base. What should I get? <laughs> and I talked about Chadwick and about Upton. And he was like, honestly, I'd go with the Upton. Learn more at UptonBase.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Uh, what, what am I missing? I'm sure I've... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the thing that uh, a lot of people are actually really happy with the in-app chat. Yeah, so when yeah, you're practicing, 
uh, there's a chat button you can press and say, hey, I'm struggling with my scales, what should I do? Or this doesn't sound good, or I'm disappointed with my playing. Uh, we offer moral support, technical <laughs> support, practice scheduling support, whatever you need, because it can be really lonely practicing by yourself. Okay, I haven't done that yet, um, and I, uh, but I love that, and that's so cool <laughs> that you're doing that. Is that Mark answering those personally, or it's, do you have a couple team, people? It's okay. Team Modacity. Team Modacity. Yeah, my, my co-founder okay. does a great job okay. on those two. Yeah, okay. Liz does a great job. Yeah. Okay, um, and and d just to place this in people's minds, because people listen to this probably in the future too, or certainly in the future, uh, it's August 2018 here, so we're talking about the feature set right now. Right. So what's, what, and, and what can you tell me about what you're planning, what you're hoping to do, what you see six months down the road, 12 months down the road, you know, as far as you want to go? Yeah, well, a lot of people have said, can this app just practice for me? <laughs> right. <laughs> So that's that's where we're headed. Okay. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, there is an element of being able to practice for someone. We're looking at like evolutionary iterative approaches to audio, so that you can hear a new version of yourself that's been evolved through our algorithms. Okay. That. Um, but short term, we're looking at like practice packs, downloadable, um, pre curated practice sessions by experts in your instrument. We're looking at social feeds so that you can track and connect with other people that Beautiful. are practicing. Okay. Yeah. Because I see so many applications. I mean, I'm already using this as a teacher. Um, I, I have the app. I've opened the app almost every lesson that I've taught since I discovered it. Mm -hmm. And I've been using it just to record students or the Metro Drone or whatever. And I have had students say, like, what's that? And yeah. <laughs> say, you should download that. Uh, the, and, uh, okay, so that's super cool. And, and, you know, as a teacher, I envision, like, oh, you can download the Suzuki Book One practice, you know, like, like here's how to really dive into that. That's exactly. Sort of thing and it's tracking about. your time. Beautiful. You can record yourself, deliberate practice as you're doing it, share your recordings with your teacher, whatever you need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other, other questions people might have, which I, I, I know are complex, is like, where's the Android version? Well, as somebody who I have my, my super simple podcast app, and even in my limited experience with that, uh, that the, the way Mark and Timo Dassey is doing it, that's the way you that's the way you develop things these days. That it's yeah. you, you can't just like oh I'm just going to also do this on it, it, there's there's just limited time and resources. So I'm I know that you you hear <laughs> you hear the call and at some point that that will probably be on the docket. Can't wait to docket. serve our iP our uh, Android users, yeah. our iPad users could use a little upgrade. Yeah. We're thinking about doing a crowdfunding, so if people are listening to this and they're like, I'm an Android user, I want to start a crowdfunding campaign, we're, okay. we're open to that. Okay, yeah. cool. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, switch gears slightly. What is it like to your, your mu so Mark was cognitive, computer science and then cognitive science That's at Northwestern. Right. That's right. And which, which we can understand some of the deliberate practice and some of those sort of things. Your mind was probably there, has been there for a long time. Um, professional musician playing in Hong Kong. Now you're like start doing a startup. You did a startup incu incubator. Like what, what, what has that whole experience been like moving into this tech entrepreneurship startup world? Just talk about as, in as much detail as you want about that experience and relationship to music or surprises or anything, anything al along the journey that, that you might have learned. Oh man, it's been very amazing. <laughs> sure. Such a journey. It's such a learning. Many times, extremely painful. I would say the most painful learning that I would encourage other people to avoid learning the hard way is the importance of team. And we we all think like, yeah, I'm just going to practice this at home until it's until it's good enough. I know Heifetz is famous for practicing a you know a whole year on a piece before he showed anybody. Silicon Valley is the complete opposite. Yeah, you build the smallest possible thing that you can do. You get it out to a few people and you say, what do you think? And if I had learned about that rapid, iterative approach earlier, I think that that would have really helped my musicianship. Um, the, there's some processes in software development like Scrum and Agile that are really cool for managing a backlog. I never realized until recently that you're always going to have more things that you can do than you have time to do. Like, I just, I kind of knew that, but it had troubled me and overwhelmed me and kept me from being successful as a musician until I realized, oh, there's this thing called a backlog, which I prioritize the backlog, draw from the backlog of my highest priorities, and then work on those highest priorities. 
How do you do that on a daily basis, either in modacity or in music or whatever you want? Because I think you're, what you're talking. I think about this sort of stuff all the time. I yeah. love nerding out on <laughs> figuring too. out what the heck to do. I have a thousand projects and I only have room for three. What do yeah. I do? Right. So, yeah. what do you do? Well, it's a work in progress, but I have all my practice items in modacity. I sequence them onto playlists, and then I favorite the most important playlists and I work out of those. And it's very easy when it's practice time. I show up, I launch Modacity, and I see my playlist, I load it up, it's got time budgeted, and I just do it. And then I graduate things via the star rating process so that I don't take on more. If I, if I know that I've only got something at three stars, I wait. Yeah. So that's the benefit of Mark being more realistic in the star rating. Jason and his four and a half or five stars for everything. It's, it's yeah. hard for me to detect because I'm just awesome at everything, apparently. So well, the effort, <laughs> it feels good. Like, oh, wow, I worked really hard. I made a lot of progress. I want to give that five stars is the tendency or four stars. Like, yeah, four for effort. But really what you want to do is be like, oh, man, that was awesome. I'm... I'm I'm two stars. Now. Okay, but so so like like in, in the journey, so like that not like so that's interesting. So I've been using it more. So I need to revise the way I've been using it more. Like finished product is the way that you're maybe envisioning. Imagine the most amazing automatic mastery of the thing that you're practicing as okay. five stars. Okay, okay, and zero being like I just got started. Okay, I need to revise my star ratings, but that's a that's a that's a useful way then because you can actually see what needs work, and I can see this being so beneficial for someone who's preparing for a college audition or a professional audition oh, yeah. or anything like that, and that and that all this info, I, or I assume it does, sticks with the piece through different playlists, yep. right? So like Mozart thirty five, I'm gonna do for many auditions over the years. I have this sort of living history of Mozart thirty five that then can be associated with different playlists. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing, and not only do you get your full history with all the improvements that you've ever made and the strategy that led to that improvement, but you also get your recordings, which is something that a paper notebook can never do. All your Mozart thirty five recordings right there. Yeah, and and the, as somebody who has like recordings strewn amongst from audio cassettes and mini discs to you know <laughs> Evernotes full of all sorts of garbage to it's and my poor voice memos you know for the last decade on my phone um, having it all like intelligently sequenced into like when you would actually be using it that is that is totally amazing I think that's why we've had a lot of lifetime subscribers okay because they're like yeah I'm gonna use this thing and it's I'm good yeah. and so now you're rolling out subscriptions so you have yeah. uh, you have a, a free level to the to the app right and then uh, some of the functionality we've been talking about, like some of the history and some of those, and the, th those are, there's a monthly su subscription, and then uh, hopefully this will, this should go out by within August still, so that you've got lifetime memberships available, at least at present, right? Yeah, yeah. it's uh, we are cutting them off at August 13th, but, you know. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, we, sorry, if we, <laughs> those You can write in if you really want a yeah, lifetime, okay, we, maybe okay. we can accommodate. But, but regardless, um, Download this app if you're on iOS. If not, steal somebody's device and download it, or, yeah. and or go buy an iPhone. No, just kidding. It's okay. You can use Android. But but um, I can't say enough good things about this. It's definitely my favorite app in years. It's the first app I've been really excited about since I don't even know for music stuff. Um, it's it's been a long time, and I've I've done a lot of clinics on apps for teachers, and I've done a lot of. Uh, articles about that too so i wish i had found modacity before i did those but i will definitely have it number one for my next my next uh projects uh i usually end with a traditional question which is advice for your younger self and this could go a bunch of different ways if you're going to talk to mark starting at northwestern or mark at Indiana, or you pick the age, but what advice, or at the beginning of this modacity process, what advice would you give some iteration of young Mark? Yeah, I think I would just be like, you know what? It's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Just pay attention to your health. Be a good human being. Don't, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> you know, and yeah. and focus on what you love mm -hmm. and what you're really, really committed to, and it'll be okay. Juan, thanks for what you're doing for making what we all love 
uh, easier to grapple with because music's a beautiful thing, but it can be frustrating. There are bumps and challenges along the way, um, and it's the same can be said for diet and fitness. And and it's and we see how much progress and how people have made in terms of diet and fitness in the app world or meditation or so many other things and it's great to see music catching up and it's thanks to you in large part that that you know that that uh that it is catching up so yeah music yeah thanks <laughs> Go to all music. the people practicing with modacity yeah cool man thanks a lot thank you jason Mark, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, modacity.co. Download the app if you are on iOS. If not, <laughs> get in touch with Mark. You can do it through the website and let him know that, well, you can let him know that you want an Android app, although obviously people have done that. But if any of you are interested in, like Mark was talking about, starting some sort of crowdfunding, Kickstarter, or what have you, for an Android version of this, that would be much appreciated. I totally love this thing. Like uh, it probably came through in this interview. I'm going to be filming some videos of me using this. And uh, I can't wait to see how this evolves. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome. If it's your 100th and 100th of time, whatever, <laughs> thank you for following along. If you aren't following us on your social media of choice, I'm sure we're there. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Contrabase Conversations is there, and we'd love to connect with you there. And if you want to reach out to me about anything from thoughts on this show to thoughts on any show to thoughts on future shows, feedback at Contrabase Conversations will put you in touch with me, and I respond to every message I get. If you're listening to this right when it comes out, I'm headed to New York City for some interviews early September, the week of September 9th, I will be there. So if you are in New York City and want to have some kind of meetup or just say hi, again, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. Get in touch. Let me know. That would be great. Contrabase Conversations is produced by Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases in the Dallas area. Look him up at MitchMooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper for cataloging and archiving these episodes. And we've been starting to put out best of episodes again. Thanks to Krista. So thank you so much. I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you, in this case, live from San Francisco with Mark, but every other episode from San Francisco, my place here in North Beach. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>